everyone When will they ever learn? When will they Good morning. My name is Sarah Lindsay and I am the minister here at the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Our congregation has been meeting for over a hundred years as a haven for free thinking and spiritual seeking. Our mission is to grow in our minds and spirits, to work with love for justice, and to transform ourselves and the world. Here, each of us is more than just welcomed, we are loved and embraced for who we are with all our longings and fears and hopes and dreams. If you're new and would like to know more about us or would like to be placed on our email list, you can go to our website, uuridgewood.org, or you can email our congregational administrator, Anne, at aparetti at uuridgewood.org. Both of those will be dropped into the chat so you can see them there. There will also be a link to a Google form dropped in the chat and you can fill that out. We would love for you to join us afterwards today for our special town hall meeting. You are welcome to stay and see some of the workings of a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Um, normally we have coffee hour virtually. So if you're back again with us, um, you can join us for that coffee hour next week. Welcome everyone. It is good to be with you this morning. I'll invite you to take a deep breath, settle into your space, and to listen. Whatever you arrive to this moment with, it's okay. Whatever you carry in your heart or on your mind, it is okay. Whatever fears and hopes you bring, it is okay. All you are asked to do in this moment is to breathe and be present and be you, your whole unique self here among people who love you just as you are. Right here, right now, together, we are okay. Let our centering sound today and every day remind us that we are welcome here, okay here, beloved here. Breathe and listen. Please join us in the words for lighting the chalice. They can be found on your screen. We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the energy of action as we gather together in the circle of community. I have had cause to be reminded lately of the value of deep presence, heartfelt presence, the magic that can happen when we actually are with one another with openness and honesty and sincere care. So I've never done a question box service, this kind of service we're doing today. I have watched colleagues do them year after year, but I've never tried it. At previous congregations, it wasn't a tradition, and folks were concerned that it was something of a cop-out. And so I was hesitant to try it here with you for those same reasons. 
but this is the beginning of our fifth year of ministry together. And it's the end of August and we remain in the midst of a pandemic. And I thought if ever there was a year, this is it. So we're taking the chance together this morning, the chance of asking questions and giving honest answers. So often I know I'm the one asking questions of you. If you've had occasion to meet with me for pastoral care, maybe I've asked you to tell me about your self-care practices or the theology that helps you move through challenges or what you believe happens when we die. Or maybe you've just come by to share more about what you love in this world. The times when I get to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one at your request, those are times that build relationship and deepen our commitment to each other. The relationship and commitment are also strengthened every Sunday when we do this, when we gather, see one another, yes, even on small screens, and spend time thinking together about the most important things in these ephemeral lives of ours. The time that we share, one-on-one, -on, -one, on Sundays, even in committee meetings, is all part of building our corner of the world building our beloved community. And by that, I mean a community in which all are welcomed, embraced and loved and where we support each other. These are all part of being present to one another with openness and honesty and sincere care. We're in year five and we're heading into yet another year of strangeness. And I realized that by the end of this congregational year, so by the spring of 2022, we will have spent half of our time together doing our shared work while negotiating the uncertainty of a global virus that's changed our world. I could never have predicted this would be the shape my ministry would take with you. And Lord knows I wish these days could have been simpler for all of us. But I am also so deeply grateful to be in the midst of this with you, with our community, the one we have built. I've been reminded this week of the magic of real commitment, real connection, real community. I'm so grateful to have it with you all. Thank you for your presence, your faith, your strength, your desire to learn and to know and your determination to be adaptable in the face of challenge. Thank you for being here this morning. Please join in singing our hymn, number 339, Knowledge They Say. Ron will play it through once. start by just explaining briefly how we did this and how we're going to do this. 
over the last couple of weeks, you have sent in questions. Those arrive to an email address that a handful of us service folks have access to, but I asked Olas to open them and Jeannie and I stayed away and did not look at them. So we did not get advanced knowledge about these questions. Olas then kindly organized the questions into three groupings, each with a sort of similar overarching theme. Um, so Olas is gonna ask the questions, I will be answering and Jeannie will also answer some of them. Any questions that we don't get to today because of time, we will answer in a special section of the eBlast moving forward because we don't wanna leave anyone's questions unanswered. Okay, so we're gonna start, I'm a little nervous. Um, Olas, can you tell us what our first grouping is about? Yes, absolutely. So our first category today is going to be um, personal questions, questions about your personal relationship with you, you, spirituality, et cetera. Um, and I'll start you off with uh, an easy one. What is one of your all time favorite movies and why is it so significant? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm laughing because what's challenging for me is one all time favorite movie. Um, so if, if I really had to absolutely choose, I would probably end up saying Field of Dreams. And part of that is that um, for as long as I have sort of known myself well, I've had a sort of um, like a melancholic nostalgia thing that pulls at me. And Field of Dreams, if you've seen it, does that, right? There's this sort of piece that's about like sort of, you know, some vision of like baseball as America's national pastime, but it's also about families and how you negotiate loss. And so there's a lot embedded in this one movie. Um, so, if, so if I had to choose just one, it would be Field of Dreams. If I was allowed to throw in some others, it would be a whole bunch of rom-coms because I actually really love those. Um, okay, Jeannie, you go ahead. You're muted. So um, I asked a question between the magic hour of 10 to 10 is, is the favorite movie the one that you've cried the most at? Um, and they said, no. Uh, so I would have to say the movie that I've watched the most is Patriot Games. But I think my favorite movie, and it would include a lot of tears, is The Mission. I didn't know that one. What's The Mission? Oh, that's set in South America, and it's the Jesuits and the colonizing powers in South America and indigenous people. And yeah, brought a lot of tears. Okay. If I were going to throw some more in, in contrast to, you know, tearful movies, I would throw in like Bride and Prejudice, which is a funny Bollywood take on Pride and Prejudice and Ever After, which is a Drew Barrymore like Cinderella story. Um, so now you all have some movie recommendations that you can, you can try. Excellent, thank you. So the next question is a multi-part question. Um, it is, do the UU sources uh, have authority for you? Is there a subset of human wisdom and experience from which we draw, excluding others, or is everything game? And what are your core scriptures? So big multi-part question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of pieces. Okay, give me the first part of the multi-part first. Let's try the first part. Do, do the UU sources have any authority for you? That's a, so that's a really interesting question because it also sort of embedded in it is a, is a notion of authority, right? Like, what does that mean? Um, if I take that to mean, do I take any one of the sources as more, um, more important or more like real or truthful, right? So when I think about when people talk about the authority of scripture, right? Like that, that is, it is what you have to live by. It is what you must sort of follow or do. None of our sources on their own for me are like, this is the thing that you must like take as gospel and live your life by, right? To me, it all together, all six sources are a vast abundance of truth with a capital T about the nature of being human and the nature of the world. And none of them is given particular sort of um, privilege over the others, I don't think. 
in some institutional sense, right? It's as an individual, and this may be part three of the question, as an individual, where do you tend to go first maybe? But even then it's not authority, right? It's inspiration, it's encouragement. It's not take these words as the forever truth that you must live by and never falter from. Um, so if part three, if I'm remembering part three, we'll jump there is like, which ones do I sort of hold or what do I treat as scripture in my life? Is that sort of the question? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, again, if we're taking scripture to mean something that uh, I view as like a privileged well that I go back to, I suppose if I were going to have to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna press me, <laughs> <laughs> for something that I would identify as scripture in my life, it might actually be, um, it might actually be that second source that's the words and deeds of prophetic men and women, or it might be the direct experience source. Meaning I, my, my notion of scripture is too evolving to tie to a singular text for all time. Not that you can't reinterpret a text over time and have it evolve with you. Um, but for me, I think sort of the unfolding of science, the unfolding of human wisdom collectively and the unfolding of my own experience. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna have to choose something that I would look at as sort of like fixed scripture in my life that I would never turn away from, it's probably those. I think that's true. What was question number two? Like what was the second part of that one? <laughs> Uh, uh, is there a subset of human wisdom and experience from which we draw, excluding others, or is everything game? So I think everything's game. Jeannie, what do you think about these questions? I love them. Um, and I'm going to partially put my RE cap on. Um, I would just um, support what you've said and also say that the sources are like a wellspring of inspiration for daily life. And they also can point to the diversity of the inner lives of congregants. And this has been, you know, as someone who was raised in an orthodoxy who came to UU, this is a source of great miraculous thought to me that I can look out into the congregation and understand that some people for Judeo-Christian writings are right up there in their daily lives. For other people, the transcendentalist or uh, the direct experience and that here we are gathered together. Um, so I think it points to the diversity. And I also just wanna put my cap on again for Ari to say that one of the fundamentals of religious education in the UU faith tradition is the study of other world religions. And, um, and so we recognize ourselves in those world religions and we can't help but reflect on the sources as we journey through uh, the world religions. So, um, and, and I think also that, that the sources inform our principles in new and exciting ways. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I, I think we have time in this block of questions for, for one more question. Um, <laughs> These were expansive answers. I'm very grateful. Um, so here's a short one for you. What makes you angry? Ooh, what makes me angry? Oh man. So one thing that makes me angry is having to tell my children to do the same thing 30 times before they'll do it. That one like really gets my goat if we're talking like everyday life. Um, in a more global sense, like I get frustrated um, by like politics and sort of certain states of our world, you know this, I sometimes preach about what makes me angry um, in sort of that, that realm of the world. Um, and then I will admit like one of my buttons is, um, is the like sort of um, ease with which many of us, and, and sometimes I do it too, like, so, you know, you can note the hypocrisy, but the ease with which some of, many of us sort of do that thing nowadays where we say we're gonna do something, but then back out or, where it's sort of because maybe because of technology, it's sort of easy to be like, yeah, sure. But then to like, to sort of feel like, oh, in the moment, I don't really wanna do this thing that I planned a month ago or whatever. And that can be a little bit of one of my, one of my buttons actually. Jeannie, what makes you mad? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I recently gathered with my family and I gave them all a lecture in terms of, of driving right now. 
and the fact that so many people are so burned out and moving into anger so quickly and how dangerous it is. But having said that, um, I would say the current political situation and the, the environment of, um, of the big lies um, get me nuts. Yeah. All right, so I got a bonus question for you. So Mount Rushmore currently has the faces of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. If you could add one more likeness to Mount Rushmore, who would it be and why? <laughs> oh man, that's so good. Jeannie, if you've got an answer, you go ahead because I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> I, so might I, take a, I might take a face down, but that's a whole other conversation. Well, different question. So I would be, I'd be very curious for folks to write their answers into the chat, actually. Um, so, you know, I, okay. So instinctively, my first answer was going to be like MLK, but I kind of feel like, mm, so maybe I would want to, um, and I'm going to blank on her name and this is going to, this is going to kill me, but there's one of the um, like young women who started the Black Lives Matter movement or something like I want a more contemporary and I want a person of color and I want someone whose gender identity isn't strictly male. So I think I would sort of like, it would take me some time and I'd like look around to try to figure out what I thought was the best sort of most standout um, one to choose. But, but I do think that there is a real value to <laughs> increasing the diversity of what's there. Um, but yeah, I'm like super curious what you all would say. So pop it into the chat. Um, okay, do we have to stop this grouping now? <laughs> Is that, have we reached the limit of this grouping, Alas? Yeah, there were a lot more questions. So you're gonna, you're gonna have your work cut out for you this, this uh, coming weeks, but uh, uh, yeah, I think we have to move forward. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so take a breath because we're gonna transition. Part of what drew me into the work of religious community and part of what draws many of you here with us is the way that a loving congregation takes care of each other. One way we do this is with our sincere and heartfelt presence. And it has been my hope that throughout the pandemic, as we have met online, you have felt at least some of that normal in-person feeling that one that happens when you sit side by side in the quiet with others or stand side by side and sing with others. My hope has been that even though we've been apart, you know that this is a community that cares for you. Sharing our joys and concerns on Sunday mornings is one way to be present to one another, to remind each other of those feelings we feel when we're together and to strengthen our ties to each other. So I'm gonna invite you to take a moment to type into the chat any personally significant joys and sorrows that you bring this morning and that you wish to share with our gathered community. Please sort of cease all other use of the chat for the moment. Later, you can go back to answering questions yourselves in there, but for now, please let's reserve it for the sharing of joys and sorrows. This morning, we lift up concern for those who are in the path of Ida. We celebrate new life, a new first grandchild for Catherine. We celebrate visits with friends. We feel the missing of newly moved friends. Anita, we miss you. The joy of special hugs from loved ones. We celebrate our animal friends, a new puppy.
and a new pregnancy announced. It will be an eighth grandchild in Aurora's family. We celebrate a long lived life. Jan's father will be 97 and has entered hospice. And so we send our love. Celebrate joyfully that schools are opening and seem to be on schedule. Visits with family. Mindful of the truths of our lives. Mindful of what has been shared and what is held quietly inside. We come to a time of stillness together. Please try and let your body get as comfortable as it can in your space. Try to relax as you are able. Unclench your jaw, roll your shoulders back. Breathe in and out, nothing hurried or difficult. Just, just let your body do what it knows to do and be in the stillness. We have shared of our own lives and we know that we live in a much bigger world, one that presents us with joys and sorrows and endless questions. This morning, we think with compassion of all those in the path of Hurricane Ida, in these seasons of warmth and beauty, but also danger and disaster. We remember the value of looking out for our neighbors. We are grateful for the commitment of the helpers who risk themselves. And this morning we pray for the safety of all in the path of the hurricane. We send our love to the people of Haiti who contend still with another earthquake, with the death and destruction that it brought even as recovery from other tragedies is ongoing there. May the rescuers, the healers, those who experienced loss know that they are not alone in this world. That around the globe are people praying for a time for them to rest and grieve and rebuild. We turn our hearts too to the continuing violence and death in Afghanistan. We let our hearts break with a region that has known so much pain. Soldiers and families and translators and workers and locals who have known the struggle to do what is right and to question what is right and who deserve life and joy and freedom as we all do. We pray for our leaders to have clarity and strength enough to do what is right and moral in the long run, not expeditious or popular in the short term. And we sit with our concern for our nation and for all nations around the world, facing another surge of the pandemic, facing the increasing inevitability of climate change, facing these challenging times we live in. We know how hard it can be, how it hurts to hear and to focus on the sorrow. It's okay to hurt for our world. It's okay to shed tears for our human family. It's okay to find it all just too much sometimes. Take a breath. Roll your shoulders back. 
when it feels too much. You can rest for a moment. You can breathe, relax, look around, look to this community, know that you are not alone. As we sit in silence, know this truth deep in your heart. You are not alone. You belong and you are loved. when it feels like too much, remember that we can carry it together. A smile and I love you, a genuine question, a song that soothes your soul, a moment to simply be. We have each other. In this community, we are held and we are beholden. In this community, we love and we are beloved. Here this morning, we give thanks for the magic of deep relationship. May we remember each and every day that together we can face this world we share and we can offer care, and presence. So may it be. We're going to move into our second segment of questions. Olas, what do these focus on? All right, so these questions are going to be more broadly theological, more about big thoughts and the big questions. Um, so to start, can you discuss the differences of ambiguous grief that a caregiver caring for someone with a disease with no cure experiences and how folks during the COVID crisis are experiencing this too? How can one deal with ambiguous grief since it is different than real grief, which comes, which comes when it comes and you cannot fight it, but just go through it? This is a great question. Um, for those of you who've not heard this term before, ambiguous grief um, refers to that sort of state where there's no clear resolution to a grief. So, um, my grandmother had Alzheimer's um, from the time I was probably about five until I was 18. She was in a nursing home, um, maybe when I was six, because it progressed enough. And, and But she then lived a very long time with her disease. And that's a kind of an ambiguous grief where the person that you love is there, but not there. This is that long-term caregiving or sort of long-term um, illness and you're you're sort of grieving the loss of the person that you knew, but but it's so prolonged, right? People also describe ambiguous grief around um, if you face infertility, that that can cause ambiguous grief because you're you're trying and wanting something that's not happening. There are folks who describe ambiguous grief around being single, that you're sort of you want this thing in your life, but it's not happening, and so there's a there's a sort of nonstop feeling of grieving the lack of a thing, even though the possibility of it is still present, right? So it's an unresolved kind of grief. And I think that's a really astute point to whoever posed this question, 
COVID presents a kind of ambiguous grief for us. Um, and it, sorry, that's my children. <laughs> um, ambiguous grief and COVID are not dissimilar. COVID, we're grieving, hang on one second. That's another thing that can make me mad is when my children are noisy on Sunday mornings. Um, COVID presents us with this thing around, um, like we're grieving the way our lives were and we don't know when it will return. We're also grieving more discreetly the loss of individuals, but we're grieving the potential sort of loss of everyone. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know because this is not specifically my field, but my intuition and my experience suggests that ambiguous grief, um, because of its prolonged nature, requires of us, if we're supporting someone going through ambiguous grief, it requires of us um, a great deal of sort of sensitivity and grace to the ongoing nature of it, right? We like, especially in our society, we like to be like, hey, it's been a couple months, you should be over whatever that thing was, right? So it takes us being long-term supportive and understanding of someone's pain and the sort of constant way that the grieving is happening actively all the time. But I think for the person who's experiencing the ambiguous grief, it's, it's as important, maybe even more important that there be respite, right? So that there be, from caregiving especially, that there be respite care that allows the caregiver to do other things for a little bit and focus on other things, right? That there be a certain degree of self-care that allows you to sort of regenerate and find joy in other things, even as that ambiguous grief sort of stays a low hum. Um, Jeannie, do you have thoughts on this? I think I wanna reserve it for later. Thank okay. you, yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, the next question we have for you is, what to you is prayer and do you do it? Okay, so um, this is a great question because I feel like it comes up often in UU congregations around the same sort of questions of like, what is worship and why do we use those words and why do we use the term God and like, what do they mean to folks? Um, so for me, I, I would not say that I have what anyone would term sort of an active prayer life. I don't before bed every night, you know, say a, a specific prayer, but my... Um, my sort of studies in religion and particularly in medieval spirituality, interestingly, um, medieval Christian spirituality taught me the notion that action and living are themselves a form of prayer and that the way you choose to live, if, if you understand it this way, the way that you choose to live can itself be, be understood as prayerful, right? And that, so for me, what prayer has to do with is intention. It has to do with approach, right? So it's not, am I saying the specific words that I meant to say, or am I praying to a particular thing or, you know, whatever? It's, am I living and being and speaking my hopes and fears and truths out into the world in intentional, careful, um, thoughtful kinds of ways? Yeah, so for me, prayer specifically is not, and I'm gonna get this wrong, it's that like transitive or intransitive verbs, right? Like prayer does not have to be directed at something, I don't believe, right? So prayer doesn't mean supplicating to a God or appeasing a God, not for me. It means verbalizing, whether actually vocally or just like sort of through intention and action and in my heart, it means concretizing hopes, wishes, intentions. Jeannie? Um, yeah, this is such a deep question. Um, I, would, I would say that um, for me, spiritual practices that include prayer are part of my life. Um, I don't know if I'm praying to a deity so much as I am praying within myself, my higher self, whatever, my God self. Um, and often in the depths of despair, I utter a prayer that I wish I were writing down <laughs> because it comes from my bone marrow. I also think, and it's probably given my Orthodox tradition, I, I see a relationship between 
contemplative practice and action in the world. So what I do in my interior space then leads me to impulses of action in the world. All right, thank you. So our next question is, the effects of climate change are becoming more and more apparent and the science predicts a grim future. The more that we read, the more frightening and insurmountable it sounds. The projected repercussions on the environment and the global population sound staggering. What can we do now, even as many of us have taken personal measures to help alleviate the situation to avoid sinking into despair? Ah, that question took a turn. So I was expecting sort of what can we do to alleviate climate change, but what can we do to alleviate despair is a different kind of question. Um, okay, so some days I'm not a great person to ask that of because I don't alleviate my own despair around it. Um, the truth is that it can be extremely overwhelming to consider. And I think that part of the problem for many folks like us who believe that climate change is real and want to do the right things to try to hold it at bay, the overwhelmingness can come to feel somewhat paralyzing. Um, you know, we talked last week just about play and beyond play, it's about joy. So alleviating despair doesn't necessarily happen by eliminating the source of despair. It happens by like first letting yourself feel a little bit of it, right? You can't pretend it's not there. Um, but then I, I think the combat to, to sort of, I think the combat is joy, right? So you actively seek out. So maybe it's you actively for climate change, you actively go out for a walk in nature if you can, or you draw a picture of a tree, or you, you know, listen to the rain as it falls and just let that sort of rhythmic movement of nature that will have a life beyond us, right? No matter what happens, the earth has a life beyond humanity. Um, and that finding some amount of joy in the world around us and in the people around us can help us keep, and that's probably true of any kind of despair, not just climate change despair. Um, yeah. Jeannie, do you wanna weigh in on Yeah, um, I just wanna add that, I, and it might've been in April, uh, when you uh, introduced a reading that I found life-changing, which was an excerpt from an interview done with Joanna Macy, who is, to me, the major thought leader in terms of the intersection of climate and, and despair. And she works in a field called Echo Spirituality. And I am just going to put it right in the chat here. Um, I personally found it life-changing. Did it happen? It didn't happen. <laughs> Let me try that again. Okay, so anyway, we'll, we'll get to it. But it was a reading that looked at sort of the roots of our belief systems around our relationship to creatureliness and the fact that somehow Western spirituality has created the thought that we own other, you know, creation and consequently our actions come from it. So I would just say thought leader wise, Joanna Macy and advocacy, the role of advocacy is really important. And I would say locally at USR, we have an environmental justice group. It really helps to get involved when you are feeling paralyzed by your despair. And I'm gonna just put in a plug for gardening at USR. It's like, get your hands in the dirt and we really need there are some pieces of our little campus that look like no one has been there in a while. So we really do need help. And the folks in the blazing humid heat, I've seen folks pulling weeds. So that can also help to put your hands in the dirt. To be clear, the gardening group has been doing amazing work. Also. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And they can always use more help. Olas, can you give us one more in this section? Yes, one more, okay. What is the place of animals in a UU theology? Does the first principle extend to animals and how ought we to relate to animals as you use? So there is a first principle project, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called, that um, has long been advocating that the first principle which reads the inherent worth and dignity of every 
human should be, I, I think I say being now, um, but it used to say the worth and dignity of every, I think it went man and then human, um, that it should be the worth and dignity of every being, right? And then that, in theory, that extends to all the creatures, right? Um, this is a great question. Loads of people understand the um, seventh principle about, oh, thank you, Carol. Well, it says the inherent worth and dignity of every person is what it says now, right? I, I get confused because I say being. Um, so um, the seventh principle, which is that interdependent web one, which is um, usually understood as our most environmentally inclined principle, there are loads of folks who take that and take their notion of what the first should say and from there become vegan, right? Or become like deep animal rights advocates, right? Because yes, it is absolutely possible to take the set of aspirational principles and extend that to the animal creatures that we share this earth with. Um, it is not, you know, we are non-dogmatic. That's, you know, we don't sort of say exactly always what each principle is supposed to be interpreted as saying. Um, yeah, I, I think that we need to do a better job um, of incorporating creatures into our understanding of our principles and our view of the world. Okay, so there are a few questions left in that category that you'll have to get to in a different forum, but I think we have to push on. All right, thank you.
Okay, we are into our third and final set and we're going to um, compress this more than we intended because we are aware of the time. Um, but I hope you will stay because if I'm not mistaken, these are the ones to do with the future of the congregation and Unitarian Universalism and religion more globally. Yes? Um, these are actually more like practical congregational questions uh, that will lead us well into the town hall. Perfect. So the first question is um, launching a new organizational structure in the midst of a pandemic has had its challenges. What is the board and facilitator group assessment of what's been working and what's not working? And are there in plans to in place to address any gaps? Yeah, this is a great question. And I will say that some of it is for the board, right? Some of that can be answered by the board. Um, but in, embedded in that question, intentionally or not, is, um, is sort of an, a question around the challenge of, of doing during the pandemic, right? So as you may recall, right before the pandemic started, we launched our circle structure with that beautiful pinwheel. We had a plan and we were excited and there was like a real, and the pandemic sort of rendered everyone a little like, huh, how do we do, right? And I don't know about you all, but that's something that I still feel a little bit of where it's like, I can't, I'm not as on top of things as I was pre-pandemic where there's just so many, Part of the ambiguous grief there's so much you're holding on your mind and in your heart that that there are times when you just can't do anymore so yeah the circle structures have not come into full it come into their fullness that's how i'm going to say that as we had hoped and that is something that the board can certainly speak a little bit more to about the plans moving forward but it's something that we are leadership is very aware of um and that as we move out of the pandemic you know, over the next half year, year, however long it takes, um, getting those back to running, back to sort of organizing and structuring the congregation will be important because the reason they were put in is still, if not more important than it was, right? That those circles, the structure is supposed to democratize even more, right? It's supposed to give power and agency and inspiration to all of you to do the work of congregational life. And that hasn't changed. It's just that many of our wills to do that right now is lower than it is in normal times. And my hope is that when we can be together again and we can get excited again about what congregational life means, then that will follow, right? Along with some pushes from the board. Um, Next one, we can do like maybe one more in this block. Okay. Um, do you think it is inevitable that we will merge with the CUC? Okay, that's an interesting one. So again, part of this is the question um, that the board can speak to. Um, and again, I'm gonna say there's like a question behind the question, which is about sort of the future of USR and the future of Unitarian Universalism. And what I want to say this morning, aware that, that this is a bigger question for more conversation in different fora, what I want to say this morning is that I believe that our congregation is strong, that our community is strong, and that USR has certainly an assured future, right? Into, you know, where we are, we have been, even through the pandemic, here together, doing the work, you know, moving forward as a congregation. So I have zero concern actually about USR as a viable congregation moving into the future. There are things we can work on for sure, but I feel confident in us, right? Um, but there are trends in religion, organized religion, right? Um, and there are realities of multiple congregations in close proximity, that maybe in five, 10 years will have some sort of impact on what our future or other congregations' futures look like. I'm not trying to be cryptic. There just isn't a good answer right now. I don't know that I think it's inevitable. Do I think it's possible someday? Maybe, but it's certainly not on the immediate horizon. And it's certainly, I don't think is inevitable. Yeah. Is there another short one, like real short one? If you could, yeah, if you could choose one mission or project for the USR to engage with 100% and let everything else go, 
what would it be and why? Oh man, gosh, that's a great question. I'm assuming it means sort of a social justice mission. So if I could choose, like if I could say to everybody, this is the one social justice thing that we're gonna focus, focus on for the next like year and a half and we will do nothing else. I would say that we should focus hyper locally on, I'm gonna say actually that we should focus hyper locally on wealth inequality and the diversity issues that follow. And I think that's because fundamentally a lot of our um, sort of national issues stem from the giant wealth gap and stem from our lack of integration actually, economically, racially, in lots of different ways. And that if we could get at those things a little bit better, we might just do a little better in general. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a call here as is my sort of prerogative. And I'm gonna say, we're gonna hold that hymn, hymn 142. And I'm gonna let Jeannie go ahead to introducing and supporting our shared mission. And then from there, we'll move right into our town hall. So Jeannie, go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. So we share a mission here at USR and we share a vision of a better world, one in which we work together to bring justice and one in which we dance with another in love. And we will only reach the world through the generosity and work of each of us. All our gifts are needed. A few announcements this morning. We continue to collect school supplies on Reed Porch. Keep them coming. And please also let your neighbors and friends know that about this collection so they can help support the Center for Hope and Safety as well. Please don't forget to register if you plan to attend the celebration of Helen Lindsay's life in person. And if you need the link, you can contact the office or check next Wednesday's e-blast. We will now move into uh, a town hall before we even extinguish the challenge, the chalice. So please, please stick around. Finally, a reminder that 50% of the offering this summer is going to the Center for Food Action. Please give generously to help our congregation and our neighbors. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. Is that all there is to the circus? 
Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. And then I fell in love with the most wonderful boy in the world. We take long walks down by the river and just sit for hours gazing into each other's eyes we were so very much in love and then one day he went away and i thought i'd die but i didn't and when i didn't i said to myself is that all there is to love is that all there is So there is my friend Then I know what you Must be saying to yourselves If that's the way she feels about it Why doesn't she just End it all Oh no, not me I'm not ready for that final disappointment Cause I know Just as well as I'm standing here Talking to you That when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath, I'll be saying to myself, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the boo. There